Well, greetings from Michigan State University and welcome to EAB University's Fall Webinar Series, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. My name is Robin Usborne and along with my EAB University colleagues, Amy Stone from The Ohio State University and Dr. Cliff Sadoff from Purdue University, we welcome you to today's presentation entitled, How Tree Choice Can Cause the Next Invasive Species Disaster. Our presenter today is John Ball, Professor and Extension Forestry Specialist at the South Dakota State University and the Forest Health Specialist for the South Dakota Department of Agriculture. Dr. Ball regularly shares his expertise in articles on South Dakota State Extension's IGRO website and on YouTube through a series of informational videos on forestry and gardening. He is considered a foremost authority on trees in the Midwest and has traversed the Northern Plains from Saskatchewan to Nebraska and from Montana to Minnesota, evaluating trees across the region. He has also written a book entitled Trees for the Northern Plains that contains information on more than 200 tree species. We are very pleased that he is, has joined us here at EAB University this morning. Before we get started, please know that we welcome your comments and questions. So please feel free to type them in the chat feature, which you can find by mousing over the bottom or occasionally the top of your screen. We will make note of these questions and we will have John respond to them when his presentation is finished. To keep these free webinars coming, we need your feedback. After the webinar, I will be sending out a link to a survey to fill out and if you're one of the first 10 people to fill out the survey, we will be sending you an EAB goodie bag, but we hope you'll give us your feed, feedback either way. For those of you wanting CEUs, if you would like a certificate indicating that you participated in today's live webinar, complete the survey and send an email message to Amy Stone at stone.91 at osu.edu. Certificates will be mailed to you within a week of today's program, and I will post Amy's email address in the chat feature for everyone, too. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing soon at www.emeraldashbor.info. You will fi also find the recordings for all our previous EAB University webinars there. Thank you for attending today, and John, let's see, we'll help. Let me do this here. I'm going to unmute your microphone and then you can share your screen and start the presentation. All right, thank you very much. I'll click on here and we should be ready to go. There we go. All right. Well, thank you folks for attending. And as uh, she mentioned, Robin mentioned, we'll take questions at the conclusion of this. So, you know, hopefully I can answer what questions this might have given you. This is really a presentation to give you some thought as to not EAB, which we're currently involved in, but what's coming next. And hopefully we can learn a lot from EAB to kind of forestall the next disaster, which certainly is out there, but is yet unknown. Here. Now, of course, EAB is what brought you here today, and it certainly is the problem that most of you are probably involved in, and I'm awaiting. It has not yet been discovered in South Dakota, though certainly on our borders with the recent discovery this year in Nebraska, and it's certainly been in Minnesota for a number of years now, but uh, with South Dakota now heavily involved in ash. So about 37% of all our trees are ash. It's certainly one that makes us concerned. And unfortunately, we never learned our lessons from Dutch elm disease. And that really hits today's presentation. And since I'm a professor, I always do like to start out with a quiz. So let's see what you might know. First of all, what do the following trees have in common? And I'm going to give you a small series of trees that we certainly can grow here in South Dakota. And I'm pretty sure if we can grow them in South Dakota, you probably have them in whatever state you may be uh, viewing from. The first one is Katsura tree, Cirtsidophyllum japonicum. 
which is a magnificent tree. When I worked out east, we had these trees that were nearly 100 feet tall. And in Michigan, where I also worked, there were magnificent specimens of this tree. In South Dakota, they're a little shorter. Uh, most of ours were taller then, but we do grow some of the weeping forms. We also can grow a hardy rubber tree, and this was a tree that I used when I, as a landscaper when I worked in Michigan. It's kind of an unusual tree. It has a milky sap to it. It, it is one of the most uh, northern latex-producing trees, uh, and we can grow it here in South Dakota as a, as a nice ornamental, but certainly it does even better in locations further east and south. The third tree is ginkgo, and I'm sure everybody's aware of ginkgo. It certainly has a unique history to it, and it's one that a lot of people enjoy planting in their yards. It can also be a magnificent tree. I've seen them again, 60, 70 feet tall. We had one in Boston Common out there that was huge, and every fall, the fall color was just spectacular. But we can also grow them in South Dakota, so it's a tree we frequently use here as well. And then finally, perhaps a tree that many of you don't use, but we do, and I know these are planted at Michigan State, they were in the parking lot even, and I never thought of these as a parking lot tree, particularly uh, with the uh, form to it and the fruit, which is that large brain, uh, which we now see sold in South Dakota in the fall as hedge apples, helps to keep the spiders, mice, and bugs out of the house. Uh, that's obviously a myth. The only way they work is if you hit the spider, mouse, or bug with one of these large fruits, you'll pretty well kill it. But other than that, it's not really much of a deterrent for uh, small critters to enter your home. So what do those species have in common? Katsura tree, uh, hardy rubber tree, ginkgo, and Osage orange? Something very unique. They're monotypic. They're the only members of their genus. When they get together for the holidays, they're all alone. There really aren't any very close relatives to go and visit. And they have very few pest problems. I mean, think about it for a moment. What pest problems do you see in your area on any of these trees? When I worked in plant health care programs out in New England, Properties that had catsura trees, which was fairly common, or ginkgos, which was another tree uh, that was fairly well used. We didn't have to worry about scouting or monitoring pests on those trees. Uh, they're pretty much pest free. And this is something that I learned way back uh, almost 40 years ago from Dr. Jonathan Wright at Michigan State University, where I did my uh, both my graduate degrees. And Dr. Wright, foremost forest geneticist and wrote the book, Introduction to Forest Genetics, still the book out there on the subject. But in there, and I have this as a complete quote from him because he discussed it in classes, and that, as he pointed out, monotypes should be free of pests. They have no close relatives from which pests can transfer easily because, as he pointed out 40 years ago, most insects and diseases are limited to a small group of related species. And so monotypes are free of serious pests wherever they're planted. And the author, meaning Dr. Wright, was personally acquainted with seven of these. And again, there's a number of these I did not include in my little description there. And he points out that in each of these, the freedom from pests extends to even minor leaf feeding insects. I mean, I've never seen holes really in the leaves of our hardy rubber trees. Uh, even in South Dakota here, they're, they're relatively pest-free plants. So as a general rule, and I mean it as a general rule, and like all rules, rules are made to be broken, but the more species within a genus, in other words, the more closely related trees you have, the more pests. And think about that for a minute. If you really look at it, uh, go to another excellent book written by Donald Wyman. This was kind of the forerunner to Michael Durr's Manual of Woody Plants. Anyone who went to college in the 60s and 70s probably used this as their dendrology textbook, along with Harlow and Harar's textbook on dendrology. But what I like as an ornamental book, and you can still obtain this book, of course, though it's been out of print for a number of years, Trees for the American Garden is that he has lists, and one of his lists is trees 
usually pest free. And obviously I had a list of trees that had a lot of pests. But in this are a number of trees that I've already mentioned and some others that you can think of if you can look at this list. How many of these trees really are monotypic? Uh, again, you can see the number of them that I've already covered or also have very few relatives. In other words, a genus that may only can turn, contain one or two species. And take a look at this, which I put together by looking at you know, the number of species, and obviously that is a debatable subject, uh, depending on whether you're a lump or a splitter. But you can look at these as kind of a relative scale as to how many species of maple and ash and prunus, which certainly has many, or oaks. And then take a look at the number of pests. And, and, I, and I built that list off the two books, Insects That Feed on Trees and Shrubs and Diseases of Trees and Shrubs. So it doesn't mean every one of these pests is necessarily a serious pest, uh, but nevertheless, it might be a minor leaf eater, but that still holes in the leaves. But if you can take a look, these genera, which have uh, more than 100 different species in some cases uh, globally, you know, certainly also have a large number of pests. And I mean, one good example is the poplars. Now, poplars have a lot of pests for a number of reasons. One of the fact they don't invest a lot in defenses, but nevertheless, a genus with a fair number of species in it. And it certainly is, is one that certainly is not problem free. I mean, the cherries, absolutely. You know, when people call me up and say, well, my cherry is dying, well, my response is, what's the problem? That's what cherries do. Uh, any prunus tends to be tends to be a relatively short-lived tree. Obviously, exceptions here, black cherry being one of them. But nevertheless, rather short-lived, ends up with every insect and disease problem in the book, it seems. Um, and so really have a very limited landscape life out there. But now, let's go to another category where you can see they've dropped off quite a bit. Rather than having uh, 100 or 50 or 400 different species at a global level, now we're down almost to the single digits with the exception of one. And, you know, and it's an artificial dividing line that I put in there. And you can see that that one, even in this group, has the most pests. When you get down to this group that has very few species, and again, this is relative. The gemnocladus, depending on whether you're lump or splitter, you could raise that to seven on a global level. But there aren't a lot of these uh, out there, and they have very few pests. So when I worked in Michigan, black tupelo, beautiful tree. I love the fall color to it. Really did not have a lot of serious pest problems. And yellowwood is another great example. That's a yellowwood in South Dakota. We can grow some magnificent trees. I love the fragrance to the flowers in the spring. It's a beautiful tree out there, though it tends to leaf out late, which sometimes concerns people because they think it's dead, but no, it just sleeps in a little bit longer in the, in the spring. But again, relatively few pest problems. And now, finally, the list, where you're down into the onesies, as we call it. Uh, again, some split uh, the sorts of phylum into two species, but you know, again, take a look at this. We're down now to one species, and look at the number of problems that we see here: few or none, uh, at least in terms of serious pest problems. So again, as a general rule, if you're looking at what genera may I want to be planting in my communities, if you're a city forester out there, or if you're an urban planner, or if you're a landscape architect, or even if you're an arborist out there or a landscaper looking to plant plants in the landscape, if we're really looking at sustainable landscapes, you know, one of the things we have to look at is freedom from pests and also the threat from exotics. Well, obviously, as I said, this is a general rules and there are exceptions and one of them is black locusts. If you look, there are not a lot of black locusts, uh, excuse me, a lot of uh, Robinia species out there. But uh, here's one, purple robe locust, beautiful tree in the spring. People love the long chains of flowers hanging from it. It's one of those trees on campus that I get a lot of calls about. Uh, but as you can see by this picture, that's not a very old tree. None of them are because within about five years, they're flat out killed by the locust spore. 
And so again, here's an exception. You might look at it and say, well, there's relatively few species in this genus, Robinia, but nevertheless, we do have a lethal pest in many areas, which will kill stress trees, or even for us, some of the cultivars, regardless of, of how well they're doing. Well, that brings us to another possible exception, and that's chestnut. Because if you look at the global level, there are not a lot of species of chestnut out there. So you might say this is another one of those outliers. But I'm going to use this to look at another possibility. And that is, what do these problems have in common? And we'll start out with chestnut blight. Uh, if we were doing a seminar at the turn of the last century in the early parts of like 1904, 1905, the big thing on our radar screen would be chestnut blight. And it's kind of fascinating to look back that the loss of chestnuts in that neighborhood surrounding the Brooklyn Botanical Garden where it was first discovered, they noticed chestnuts dying there 20 years beforehand. And like many of our exotics, they come in very quietly. They're often here in place before we even realize we have a new problem. I mean, the emerald ash borer is a perfect example of that, having been present in Michigan and missed for a number of years. So we might already have our new threat lurking out there that right now we're writing off as something unknown or environmental. But chestnut blight was an incredible serious problem in North America, and in some regards, as bad as uh, EAB, because if you take a look at the chestnut forest, these co-forests, in Appalachia. The chestnut trees were huge and magnificent. Uh, it was also one of the most common trees, and again, it's uh, debatable as to how much, but you know, it was said that a squirrel could jump from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi merely on chestnuts. Now, perhaps a flying squirrel, uh, because it wasn't that dense, but it was one of the more common trees of the eastern deciduous forest, and starting out in the early part of the last century, it started to disappear. And when people talk to me about EAB, Emerald Ashbourne, say, you know, this is, this is horrible. It absolutely is. But we've been through this before. And if you look at this picture of what you're seeing are all dead chestnuts. It gives you an idea of what we've seen in this country almost a century ago. Well, obviously, that was followed in the 1930s by Dutch elm disease. And in Michigan, and the campus in the 1970s, we still had quite a few elms on campus. Uh, but those have been lost over the years, and except for those that are now being protected by injections. And where I'm in in South Dakota, we still do have some elm lined streets. The Dutch elm disease did not arrive in South Dakota until about 1967 and took almost 20 years to cross the state. Uh, the last county was affected in about 1985. But for those of you living further east, and when I lived out in Maine and Massachusetts, you know, we had areas that were called, well, we used to have elms here because those magnificent streets, there was almost no better urban tree than an American elm. It could tolerate our planting conditions, had this beautiful high canopy. Because it was so nice, it became the flavor of the month or the year or the decade, into which some communities, particularly in the Midwest, almost 80% of their street trees were of a single species, American elm. And obviously, what happened is as the American elms became infected with Dutch elm disease, we began taking them down, a process that's still ongoing here out in the Dakotas. And that, but also in many areas, as these trees came down, we planted them with ash. And what we went from was elm line streets to ash line streets. And now, of course, with emerald ash borer, we're cutting them down again. So we've been through this at least three times. So what do these all have in common? When we take a look at chestnut blight and we look at Dutch elm disease and emerald ash borer, two pathogens and an insect, first, the pest became a deadly threat when introduced to a new continent. Chestnut blight. Dutch elm disease, emerald ash borer are not native to North America. But obviously here's where they became the attention getter, where we've lost the trees. And the setup for this is that the pest attacks a genus, not a species. 
as we've learned, it doesn't matter whether you have green ash, white ash, black ash, pumpkin ash, uh, they will be attacked by the emerald ash borer. And it didn't matter whether you had American elm, slippery elm, a rock elm, they were attacked. And the other part of this was each genus has species in all three temperate continents. That should be a pause for concern for you. Not only when you're looking at what trees to plant, you know, is this a, a genus that has lots and lots of species? In other words, as Dr. Wright pointed out, a lot of close relatives that you can transfer to. But also, is this genus found anywhere else? In other words, are you planning, looking at planting a genus that, you know what, it's found in Asia, for example, and there may be a pest in Asia, not introduced here yet, that could show up and spend a decade or more kind of hidden out there in the landscape and then suddenly rearing its ugly head or uh, for a disease, the mycelium, all right, and end up killing our North American trees. Santa Morph back in 1990 uh, proposed no more than 10% of your trees in a species, no more than 20% in a genus, and 30% in a family. And I know for a lot of communities, this has been considered the, the standard. That if you take a look at your street tree plantings, your park plantings and such, that if you only have 10% of species, 20% of genus, and 30% of the family, you have the diversity in the community that you need. But I say it's not enough. And by the way, Santa Morph, even in his writings, does not look at this as, take it as the gospel. He just meant it as a general statement that we do need to diversify. But as he pointed out, it still may not be enough. And my recommendation is no more than 5% of your urban forest from any one genus. Now imagine that, that if you only had 5% of your urban forest recover, if you will, of one genus, these exotic threats are not as serious to it. And, and you know, again, if you say, well, you know what, I've got diversity out there. I only have 10% of my trees is green ash, 10% of my trees is black ash, 10% of my trees is white ash. Now, again, even that violates Santa Morse, no more than 20% in a genus. But nevertheless, the over-reliance on only a few species, particularly only a few species in a genus, is certainly going to increase the risk of catastrophic losses, a, something we've already seen in urban communities with ash and elm. I'm not too worried what's occurring at the family level. I'm not so concerned about your diversity that you know more than 30% in a family, most likely you're going to be able to achieve that anyway, but we really don't have very many serious threats that cross families. I mean, we do have verticillium, of course, that can affect uh, smoke trees, as you see pictured here. It can also affect elms which we've seen a lot of loss from in this last year out in the Midwest. It can also affect uh, ash, maple, and such. When we start looking at problems that cross into different genera within a family, well, we certainly have fire blight, which has a number of different rosaceae hosts. And then even within that, we have some uh, in the Olenaceae family, for example, the ash and privet bore, which do affect, uh, affect a number of genera there. But these are fairly limited, so I'm not too worried what's occurring out there at the family level, but I am very concerned of what's your planning and what's, what's happening out there at the genus level. Now, another point in here is following this 5% rule will not reduce pest susceptibility. In other words, if only 5% of your urban forest was ash, that you're going to have those trees survive EAB. Of, of course, that's not the case. The purpose is reduce the economic impact of a pest to a community. So again, you would still lose those trees unless they are protected, unless they are managed, as, as the EAB University has had a number of excellent presentations on. But think of it, think of it particularly out here in the Midwest, that if only 5% of urban forest was ash, the threat of EAB wouldn't be nearly as much when you're looking at 30% or 40% of your trees, of your urban forest, of the single genus. So, no more than 5% of the urban forest from any one genus and be very cautious with species-rich genera. 
So in other words, when you're trying to look at what's the mix, I'm going to try to have about 20 different genera. And again, that's a goal, not something that you might absolutely uh, be able to realistically do. But nevertheless, if you look at that, be very cautious of species-rich genera. If you go out there and look, and there's 500 different species in the particular genus you're looking at, again, as Dr. Wright pointed out, there's a lot of pests that may possibly transfer. The other thing, it's even more important for genera found in all three temperate continents. So really, when you're looking at what to plant now, what to plant after the loss of EAB, or what to plant as you're anticipating EAB to reduce the uh, the impact of this of this pest. Well, don't just be looking at, okay, I'm going to plant this and this. Start really being forward thinking here. You know, kind of take a look. Is, is the particular species that I'm in in a genus with lots of other species? Is this particular genus also found on, on the other two temperate continents? Though we could have it, so we could have a transfer of a pest that may be yet unknown. These are things you really need to consider. And why is that important to know if you're moving genera across the planet? As, as has been pointed out by a number of people, Dan Herms has done presentations on this, uh, Nielsen has as well. If evolutionary history, Increased stress reduces resistance to the pest. This is something that a lot of us learned in college back 40, 50 years ago, that if you keep the tree healthy, all right, and by providing it adequate amounts of resources, not luxurious amounts, but adequate amounts, that that tree can defend itself because trees do defend themselves against a number of threats. And then, obviously, if the tree is stressed, that it's more vulnerable to pest problems. And, of course, we see this with birch, paper birch. Uh, paper birch seems to do very well, uh, from bronze birch borer even, until the tree becomes stressed or starts beginning to decline from old age. And then bronze birch borer grouse does what it's supposed to do. It's nature's recycler. Finishes you off, recycles you quicker. But... If there's no evolutionary history, there's little relationship between stress and resistance. You know, this is one of the things we found back in the 70s in uh, Lansing, Michigan, for example. If you went into some of the subdivisions and you found uh, European white birch or some of the other Asian birches even that were planted back then, those were the trees that were attacked and killed very young. You know, one neighbor might have a paper birch planted on good soils, doing well. It was not affected. But any of the exotic birches were. And, I, and what I thought was interesting is back then there was even thought that the Asian birch would be resistant or tolerant of bronze birch bark. There's no reason it should be. It had no evolutionary history with it. And sure enough, that has been found to be true, that these trees are attacked. So really didn't matter how healthy you kept your European white birch. Back in those days when we seemed to have a very high population, of bronze birch borers in urban areas, these trees were seeked out and destroyed. And the same is true with ash. If you take a look, and there's been a number of excellent papers that have looked at susceptibility of ashes to emerald ash borer, and if you look at them, all our native ash, with the possible exception of blue ash, uh, Fraxus quadrangulata, seem to be fairly easily killed by these very high populations of, of emerald ash borer. The exception being some of the Asian birch. Now, early on, at the beginning of this epidemic, there was a few calls saying that, wait a minute, out in our arboreum, even this Chinese ash is being attacked. And then on later discovery, finding that the tag was wrong and it was actually a green ash, and so it made sense, but the Manchurian ash is one that we don't see a lot of problems with. However, this one is susceptible to our native uh, ash insects. Uh, Clearway ash borer, for example, attacks it very readily out here on the Great Plains. And so really, when you go out and look, and, and here I am in China. This is northeastern China, um, up there almost on the North Korean border south of Harbin beautiful, rich forests up in that region. Uh, this one is a particularly about six, 60,000 acres that I work in. That's a Ammer choke cherry, for those who are familiar with that tree. But when I'm out there, and here's, here's their ash. They have it. Fraxus manchurica, for example. 
And there I find the emerald ash borer in this forest, but doing and acting as I expect an agralis to act as nature's recycler. It's not attacking healthy ash trees. What it's doing is attacking and killing the overmature ash or the ash off site on rocky outcrops, for example. The only time I really see problems with emerald ash borer in China is two. One is you go into cities, and there, there are young ash that are planted under very hostile conditions, even if they are the native ash species, are easily attacked and killed. And the other thing that I find fascinating is that if you plant our native ash there, our native ash, uh, Fraxus americana, for example, white ash, known over there as garden ash, it's easily killed by EAB. In fact, I've been out there and seen double rows where one row is the Manchurian ash and the other row is our, um, one of our American species. And EAB has hammered the North American species, but has not really affected the Asian species. Again, as long as they're planted on good soils and that. Stress locations, any ash is vulnerable to EAB. That's a picture of the forest. And I mean, if you look at that picture, what do you see? You see maples, you see ash, you see birch in the background. These are incredibly rich forests, no different from our native forests uh, that are part of the Eastern deciduous forest that look almost identical to it. And in that Asian forest, look at the genera I can find in that 60,000 acres. You know, firs, maples, alders, birch, the list goes on and on, and in those, what do we have? Pests. Again, we need to spend more time in China, Europe too, of course, but we need to spend more time in China, which has become our major trading partner, and taking a look at what might possibly come from there to here. What's out there attacking their stressed maples and oaks and such? And I know some people are out there doing that already to take a look at what may end up being inadvertently carried over here accidentally and now recognize our trees as suitable hosts, yet our trees have no defenses or very limited defenses. So let's look at some. Maples have become in many areas the go-to trees for emerald ash borer. I already know communities that now they're fixated on one tree, Freeman maples. Autumn blaze being the most common, and we're going back to the onesies again. Okay, we don't plant ash. Before that, we don't plant elm. And we certainly do want to plant some elms. We do need that diversity. We don't want to plant ash now. So what are we going to go to? We're going to go to maples. And the autumn blaze maple being probably the most common. And then I understand why excellent fall color also has a very fast growth rate, the two things people really prize in the ornamental trees. But when you start looking at maples as the next tree to go, remember, is it found on all three temperate continents? Because these barriers, such as oceans and mountain ranges, has greatly influenced how these species have co-evolved with their own pests. And moving from one continent to another, again, those pests can still recognize the native trees now as suitable hosts in many cases. But those native trees may have no or very limited defenses. So look at the setup. There's more or less the ranges of chestnut globally. And of course, chestnut blight is, uh, chestnut was found in all three continents and chestnut blight moved from there to North America, it moved to Europe as well. And we lost our native trees, but we can plant Chinese chestnuts just fine, even here in South Dakota on the very Southern end. Look at elm, Dutch elm disease. We have elms in China, we have elms in Europe, we have elms in North America. Dutch elm disease may have originated, in, and that arrow doesn't mean up by Harbin, it just means somewhere in Asia, it appears to uh, have occurred. Moved to Europe, and then of course, moved to North America. But you know what? We can plant the Asian elms, and they seem very tolerant or very resistant to Dutch elm disease. Uh, lace bark elm, for example. Uh, we plant here in the Dakotas. That's one picture of one there. And then ash. Once again, what do we have? We have ash native to Asia, Europe, and North America. And the emerald ash borer ended up coming to North America, and we're losing our trees. And if you were reading any journals from Europe, they're also having a loss of trees, but not due to emerald ash borer, due to a fungal disease. 
that appears to have been introduced from China. So again, when you're looking at trees to plant, are they, is that genus found on the other two temperate continents? If there is, pause for concern. So the Manchurian ash, you know what, we can plant that. Doesn't have a lot of problems, does get our native ones in that. But again, chestnut, elm, ash, and maple. Maple's the one I'm concerned about. Certainly we know the, the Asian longhorn beetle, uh, which has moved into North America. But my thought is, what else may be lurking in China, as an example? Because it is our major trading partner, and we do have forests that are very similar. And we have a lot of maples there. They have the most maples, the most diversity of maple species. What may be lurking over there is a small insignificant na uh, insect, nature's recycler, that may get introduced into North America. And now that we're heavily relying on maple, which has become the go-to tree, that we may begin losing all our native maple trees. Another one that I worry about are oaks. Oaks are magnificent trees. I certainly love to see them in the landscape. They are not without their problems, of course, but, and, but some, such as northern red oak, magnificent fall color, particularly in areas where we don't have to worry about oak well, which as you get this far west, we don't really see much incident of. But look at oak. You know, I really worry about planting a lot of different oak species. Look how many continents oak is found on. Look at how many potential sources for exotic threats that we have. Linden's the same way. If you take a look at lindens, you know what? We have a lot of different possibilities as well here. Uh, there are some magnificent trees here as well. I happen to really be fond of the silver linden. I love it when the wind blows through and you get that nice light underside to the foliage, but look at lindens. So a lot of the genera that we flock to for planting, um, you know, have a lot of common uh, species on these other continents. And we need to be thinking about that when we start planting these more in the urban forests our ash replacements. So, okay, what else can we plant then? All right, you looked at this and said, okay, it looks like oaks, we need to dampen our enthusiasm. I didn't say not to plant them. Maples, certainly, because that's been the go-to. And maybe you're not gonna get all the maples down to 5% of your trees. I understand that, but take a look at your maples. And if you're looking at 20 or 30% of your urban forest as maples, you now have the same setup we had with emerald ash borer. And the same with oaks, though that's a less common street tree out there. But what else can we plant? You know, one of the other concerns is malice that's found everywhere, crab apples and such. And look at this tree, common hop tree. It's not very commonly planted. I remember looking at this in the woods of Michigan. It was a small tree, quite often found along streams. It's not without its problems, but it is being used as an ornamental. It's a very tough tree. I can show you abandoned windbreaks out in the Dakotas, where the two trees that are left still out there are lilac and hop tree. And this particular uh, picture is taken from North Dakota State University up in Fargo. And to me, it has that nice form of a small ornamental tree. I happen to like the flowers. Uh, the flowers are fragrant, uh, reminding me of fresh cut alfalfa. Uh, it's kind of a nice, nice fragrance, particularly for us early June, a time period that we're already a little, little behind the big floral displays we have in May. And that, so I, I particularly enjoy this plant. No real fall color to it, but it does have an interesting bark to it. But look at hop tree. Uh, we have about seven different species of hop tree but they're all native to North America. You are not gonna lie awake at night wondering what exotic threats coming in from Europe or Asia or Australia or South America or Africa or heaven forbid, Antarctica, right? There are no close relatives. There's nothing that could easily transfer. Are they pest free? No, but they have relatively few pests. Uh, bunnies seem to love them, I'll admit, when they're young, and yes, they self-seed as much as amber maple. So again, they're not a perfect plant. But this is one of the plants that I think we ought to consider, and this is the sort of thing we need to be looking at is, okay, a genus with relatively few number of species and no close relatives on any of the other continents. Hop hornbean's another example of that. Australia Virginiana, small tree, and is it pest-free? No. Uh, 
Um, I can remember in Lansing, Michigan, we had a number of these killed that were on stress sites as street trees, and they were attacked by the two-line chestnut board and killed. So again, not a completely pest-free tree, uh, but still a very interesting tree. I like to see it used out in the landscape. It is used as a small street tree in some locations. Even in Brookings, South Dakota, we have some examples of it. Uh, I kind of like the the pods there, if you will, the seeds hanging down there in clusters. It's kind of attractive. Not a real fall color to it, but nevertheless, it adds to the diversity of the landscape. And yes, there are some found in Asia, right? Both in China and Japan and even down into Korea and that, but still a fairly limited number of species on both our continents. Coffee tree is one that I'm really trying to promote. Again, I don't want to see it over planted, but so far, no fear of that. Um, but it's a wonderful tree, and no matter where I've lived and worked, I have never worried or seen much problem, and by problem, I mean insects or diseases, with Kentucky coffee tree. And that it's a very interesting tree. I like the large canopy to it, fairly open canopy that, that the leaves produce. It is considered one of our solar friendly trees because it leaves out late. So late, in fact, that Dr. Wright used to take people out and say, what killed this tree in the spring? Everything else would be in leaf and what he was hoping for to catch a graduate student that would say, well, it must have some sort of disease without realizing it's a coffee tree and they tend to wake up late. And that it does have a fragrant flower, though you have to get fairly close for the fragrance. And I kind of even like the pods. Though again, there are some seedless cultivars out there now, because as anyone who's ever worked in a garden center, and I did for years, you know, the two kisses of death for garden center trees is if they're slow growing, because everybody wants three foot a year, hence the Freeman maple uh, binge, and then anything with fruit on it. And I happen to kind of like looking at the pods in the tree. Uh, but nevertheless, if you wanted a, a male cultivar, you could get them and avoid this. But look where they're from. Again, I'm not going to lie awake at night and think, what could end up attacking coffee tree? Look at, they have very few species, maybe only two, possibly up to seven, depending on how you split these. But even in Asia, fairly small natural range, and actually a lot of that's down in Laos and Vietnam, and we're really talking about subtropical trees rather than temperate trees. The temperate trees are really pushing it. It's kind of a zone seven tree, if I've got it right, in China. And I have seen it over there growing in southern China, uh, down near Guangzhou, um, uh, Nanine, for example. And there, there's a picture of it. If you, if you saw it in the woods, you'd say, hey, you know what, that kind of reminds us of our coffee tree. And what I do get a kick out of it is when I ask the locals, you know, what was the name for it, uh, it translated, if I have it correctly, as soap tree, uh, that you could make soap out of it. Uh, and I thought that was kind of a kick because we tried to make coffee out of ours. And if anyone here has ever ground, roasted, roasted and ground the beans, make sure you roast them and grind the beans and make coffee out of it, you will know why you're going to Starbucks. Uh, it is a very, very, very poor coffee. And you know what? I haven't tried soap, but it might, might be a better, uh, a better choice. I know some that are listening or might be saying, well, wait a minute, John. Uh, you know, you mentioned a number of native trees in here. Are uh, you just looking at natives, such as our hop horn beam, our uh, coffee tree and that. And I say no. We really do need to look at exotic trees as well because native trees are no defenses against exotic threats. Um, I've talked to a number of native plant societies and communities that you know have said well if we just plant native trees we won't have these problems. And again as almost everybody listening to it says of course not. I mean look at the loss of the American elm, the strictly elm, the rock elm, the green ash, the white ash, the black ash and that all native species they have no defense or very few defenses against these exotic threats. So I think we do need to look outside the box. I think we do need to examine and look at exotic trees as well and exotic genera as well to introduce here or to utilize here as part of our diversity in the urban forest. Macchia is one of my favorites. And so now you're getting an opinion, but 
Here is a genus, the relatively few species, two that I know of, uh, that occur in Asia. There are no uh, European or North American equivalents, so the introduction of that pest, at least in my experience over the last 30 or 40 years of looking at this planet, I have not seen really any serious pest problems on this particular tree. It does get a few problems to it. Environment can certainly affect it, but I love it. As a nice small tree, it adds a lot to the landscape. I think one reason it's never caught on is when it flowers. Flowers at the end of July or sometime in July. Anyone here that's ever worked a garden center knows everybody flocks to a garden center in the spring. If it's in bloom in the spring, people buy it. Nobody's in a garden center sometime in mid-July and August, so they miss seeing this in bloom. I only get calls about this tree when someone happens to be driving down a street, sees several of these, and, and calls me up and says, what's that tree blooming at this time of year? And, of course, it's an Amer Machia, and they kind of like the idea of that as a nice small, I'll call it a crab apple substitute, not, not truly a substitute in, in, uh, other than size. But I also like the spring color of the Amaramachias in the spring. The leaves have a little of this fuzz to them, and they come out in almost a silvery appearance. It's rather attractive in the bark with that coppery color to it, too. I find this a tree that provides multiple seasons of interest, something we always try to look for in ornamental trees. Admittedly, it's a small ornamental tree. The, again, the hop tree uh, is a similar size to it, but I think this has a better place in the landscape than we've allocated it so far. And what about alders? Now again, there are Asian alders. This in fact is an Asian alder, alder or Manchurian alder, from which this cultivar, Prairie Horizon, was developed. This is an introduction uh, by uh, North Dakota State University. Uh, Dale up there released this before he retired, and I've looked at this tree in a number of locations, and I really like it. Now, it's not a huge tree again, small tree, but how many alders do you have in your landscapes? You know, well, there, and, and if you do, you might just have the European, and obviously here you'd have two species. But uh, again, alder's one that most people don't think about, but if you take a look at, again, diversity at the genus level, this there might be a place for including more alders in the landscape where appropriate. And hickories, the, I'll admit, that's a very hard sell. Uh, it has two things going against it. It's slow growing and has a nut. And I, I, I know why people don't like them. When the nuts fall on the, on the sidewalk, it's like walking over big marbles. And that squirrels will be thrilled to death if you plant these more. You know, there's certainly places for them, parks. Uh, maybe parking islands if you don't have cars very close to them. Uh, which are going to get hit by the falling seeds. But I've introduced this one more on our campus, of course, for campus planting, park-like plantings to it. I think they're magnificent trees. After about 30 years, they start getting that shaggy bark to them. They can have somewhat of a yellow fall color. I'll admit they grow slow, but they tend to start out slow. And after about 10 or 15 years, speed up a little more, much like coffee trees do, which seem to grow very slowly for the first couple of years. And then Suddenly they start growing, and I can show you places where coffee trees and ash were planted almost side by side. In the beginning, the ash trees were far ahead of the coffee trees in height growth, but after 30 years, they're about the same size. So I think we also need to get away from this idea that everything has to be fast growing, or everything, when we put it in the ground, has to be fast growing right out of the box. And if we do, we can add a lot. And on these, I really like the leaves as they're coming out. If you've ever looked at a at a uh, uh, hickory, shagbark hickory, just before it leaves out. You almost have these huge bulbs hanging from each of the bare branches. It's an attraction that I think most people overlook until they really notice it, and it is kind of pretty. And then Turkish filbert, uh, another tree that really is underutilized. Uh, we can grow them out in the Dakotas. We have some in Minnesota that you know, or 40 or 50 feet tall, and we don't have a lot of this genus planted out in the landscape. We certainly do a lot of birch, some close related, uh, close related genus to it, but Corleus is one that's been overlooked because most of them are shrubs rather than trees, and this one could be, could fit very nicely into your urban landscapes. Well, 
this is the book that she mentioned early on. It's trees, fruit, nut, ornamental shade, and windbreak trees for the northern plains. And so this really covers that vast area of the Canadian prairie and the, uh, and the plains uh, of, uh, of the United States. But in there, one of my challenges, and one of the reasons I wrote this book was the fact that I really wanted people to go out and look at what you could plant out here. Now, wherever you're listening from, you have local books as well. Michigan, Minnesota, Matt, well, Michigan, Mass, uh, Minnesota would be part of this book, but you know, you pick anywhere in this country, there's local sources and you really need to look at those as expanding the plant palette of what you're planting. But in this book, one thing that I mentioned there is trees like spouses and politicians should not be selected based solely on a single characteristic. And I'm certainly not trying to erupt the uh, Clinton-Trump debates anymore. We've all endured that. But, you know, too often we go for just one characteristic, and that's once we get that, we'll buy it. Uh, here was one of my classes. We're standing in uh, Hyde Park in, in uh, London. And, of course, they're enthralled by this horse chestnut in beautiful bloom. And, well, gee, can we plant that? Well, you know what? It does have a lot of problems as well. So, again, we need to think of the whole picture rather than just one characteristic of a tree when we go to select it. So, when wouldn't you do this? When do you have to be careful when you're selecting? What are situations in which a procedure, trying to, trying to get that diversity, is potentially inadvisable? Let me give you some examples. Diversity does not always mean stability. This is something that was taught in all our ecology classes back in the uh, 70s. So just merely throwing more plants out there isn't necessarily going to create a more stable environment. Planting a wide range of trees that are not well adapted to the site is counterproductive. One of the things we really need to learn from EAB is nowadays soil is important. Elms and ash, green ash, I didn't even care if you had soil. You could grow that tree. But as we're starting to look at others, yellowwood, for example, it is kind of particular on what sites to plant. And so we're really going to have to go back and do our homework and look at, well, what sites are we planting these on? You know, the Arnold's book from 1980, Trees and Urban Design, another classic, which everyone should read or reread, pointed out there's little logic in planting less vigorous alternate species as an assurance against pestilence. I mean, even before EAB was on the screen. Uh, you know, he certainly knew about Dutch elm disease, but you know what? We don't just want to go out there and start planting. We want to think about what we should be planting. Another, the species environmental requirements must match the site conditions. Once again, we're going to have to pay more attention to site. What's the soils? What's the microclimate? You know, we can get some pretty bizarre urban plantings out there, and, and this one's probably the best. Skip Kincaid out of uh, St. Louis sent me this picture. And this is a city's engineer of a street plant, a street tree planting. It's in the street. And if you look at both these poor trees there, I mean, imagine trying to survive in a street environment uh, like that. But we really need to pay attention to sites. And what are we going to plant? Because the easy trees, the trees that would go anywhere, we've pretty much used up. And if we look at a diversity, do we do it by the street, by the block, by the community? I think one of the best books written in 1911, Shade Trees in Towns and Cities. You know, he looked at, it's important to plant, I love this, important to plant as many good trees as possible. But his recommendation was all the specimens on a street should be of the same kind. And he did that from an ornamental standpoint and a maintenance standpoint. In other words, on one street, he would, he would suggest planting all sycamores or all maples or all oaks. The idea being that they're all going to have similar growing condition requirements. They're all going to grow at approximately the same rate. It's going to provide a kind of unifying theme to the neighborhood. So I see some value in that. You know, it's probably little difference in terms of pest risk. I mean, what it amounts to, it's going to ease the maintenance of done by street. And if you get EAB, you're taking down all the trees along one street rather than running around the community. But you know, the fact that you're going to plant them and separate them by wide spacing, other than diseases such as Dutch elm disease that spread by root graft, and if you have an entire street of American elm, you probably, or you probably did quickly lose them, there's probably little difference in that as to how you mix it up once it's in your community. The other here is, while nothing is native to the urban forest, right? when people call me up and say, I want to plant a native tree, nothing's native to towns. It's an artificial environment. 
I still would caution people not to forget about the sense of place. You know, our urban trees are always exotics, even quote our native trees. They're isolated from other trees rather than growing in a forest on highly modified soils surrounded by turf grasses. You know, what I refer to is, you know, kind of the McDonaldization landscape. We put everything the same. No. If you're in an area dominated by oaks, it's nice to have oaks reflected in the community. Maples, that. I mean, the New England forests ought to be reflected in their town as much as they, much as they can. So while I have no problems and, in fact, encourage the planting of exotic trees, I'm certainly not looking to create a landscape that no matter where you go, it looks the same, much as the menu does at McDonald's. Uh, I would still like New England reflected in their urban plantings in the Midwest and such. But again, with that caution that we may also have to kind of put a few more eggs in that basket by considering even exotic trees as part of the mix to create that diversity. And be careful not to create problems by planting invasive species. You know, once again, exotics can be good, but exotics can be bad. In many areas, including South Dakota, our cork trees are now becoming a weed, uh, much as Norway maple has out in the uh, east. Uh, these are self-seeding in our woodlands and that, so we've now brought a tree from Asia, the only place it's native to, introduced it to North America, which has relatively few pest problems, but now it's become a pest in itself. Buckthorn, probably my other good example, and that's a fairly large buckthorn as you see pictured here. This was brought into this country and clearly is a weed uh, found in uh, shelter belts, windbreaks, anywhere bird will place a seed, you'll get one of these growing up. And if it's a female, it's going to be loaded with fruit. And this is another one that I think everybody looking at say, why did they ever introduce it? So I also note that as a caution, and maybe it might be best to introduce male or fruitlet, fruitlet clones first, so we're not adding to the problem as well. So I am aware that, you know, even there for exotics, we have to use a great deal of caution in our introduction of them. So with that, I'll finish up a little before uh, the hour, as I tried to do to make sure if there were questions, we have a little bit of time for those, because I'm sure everybody has busy days. But with that, I'll conclude. There's my email for those that uh, uh, want to catch me on something. And I will point out, much of what I've talked about today is just showing up in the October issue of Arborist News. So if you're interested in this topic, want to do a little bit more reading on it, I have an article in the ISA, International Society of Arboricultures, Arborist News, October 2016, and an article in the January 2015 in American Nurseryman, which is not identical, but certainly covers this kind of broad topic. So with that, I'll stop and turn it back to Robin. Well, thank you, John. I I've learned a lot during this presentation. I, I hope all our other participants have as well. Um, this has been fascinating. Uh, I, I do have a question here from Rachel. Isn't there a fungal disease that is very detrimental to filberts? And also, what are your thoughts on the native cor Corleus species? Well, that was a good one. And yes, I, um, I, I'm sorry if I might have said that it's completely pest free because it's not. It's as an example of one to consider. Uh, the native Coralis, again, in South Dakota, we're kind of at the limits. There are, they are being used for nut production, not as an ornamental uh, Coralis americana, for example. And we certainly have the contorted filbert for the European, but we really don't have any trees other than the Turkish filbert. So yes, depending on your location, a good example is I can plant oaks out here. We don't really see oak wilt this far, but I'd be cautious about planting uh, our uh, red oak group in areas, uh, for example, when I was working in Kalamazoo where we certainly had a real problem with it. So these are meant as examples, not as take these and, and plant them, but just to point out some of the diversity you may not have in your but uh, thanks for Rachel to point that out. All right, Andrea Distorrance asks, is anyone exploring far southern South America for suitable urban trees? Great question. Uh, I've been down there as well, and I'll remember the first time I saw uh, Juglans below uh, Bloiana, the uh, Bolivian. Um, 
walnut, which is growing at high elevation that, you know what, there are some, which is kind of interesting, there are some genera there that, uh, again, we have examples of here, but there's also plants that we really don't have a lot of. The difficulty is you really have to get up either high elevations or fairly far south in Chile and Argentina to run across enough of a temperate zone where we have trees to select from. So you're right. That certainly is an area that needs to be looked at as well. I don't worry about it as a concern because, again, we don't have much of a uh, temperate zone in the southern hemisphere, and we don't have a, uh, the boreal forest at all in, that, uh, in the southern hemispheres. But nevertheless, right, looking beyond uh, Asia and Europe for other, other trees to plant, uh, but the pickings get pretty slim there and also Australia, unless you're in, um, you know, perhaps a zone seven uh, area where uh, admittedly there some of our Australian plants have become weeds as well. But good point. We need to look in South America as well. All right. That seems to be the end of the questions uh, here during the webinar. You may be getting questions in your email box right now as we speak. But um, that being said, I want to thank you again, John. This has been really informative. And I also wanted to let everyone know uh, this recording will be on the www.emeraldashbor.info website on the webinar page uh, to, to look at afterwards. Um, hopefully, I will get this, uh, be able to get this on the website by tomorrow. Um, I want to thank everyone for attending. This was great to have everyone on, and I hope you learned a lot. And, John, I hope you have a great day, and uh, thanks again for sharing your information with us. Well, it's wonderful to be kind of uh, virtually back to Michigan State University, so thanks for the opportunity to speak. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Have a good day.